books and turn to page 17. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Page 17, let's stand as we find our place in our hymnals and let's all sing together. Actually, we'll see on the slides. Because he lives. Anyone know Because He Lives? That's a wonderful song, isn't it? All right, we'll watch the slides and we'll sing Because He Lives. <laughs> Because he 
Thank you for making the Lord Jesus Christ a priority uh, in your life today. And I'm not saying that those who could not make it uh, didn't make that effort. But the fact that you're here uh, and you say, well, it's Easter. A lot of churches don't have an evening service on Easter. Uh, now, some of them make up for it. They've had one on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, they've had all kinds of services. But I'm thankful that we get to gather once again uh, and worship the Lord on this Resurrection Sunday. Unfortunately, our president has seen fit to try to rename uh, this day as Transgender Visibility Day uh, and give the honor or really the attention uh, to those who are living a life uh, that's in total uh, opposite of what God has commanded us to do. Uh, and I think personally that flies in the face uh, of what this day is supposed to be about. Uh, I hope that you'll remember it when you go to vote, uh, that this type of thing is being told to us. Uh, no mention of the Lord Jesus Christ and the meaning of Easter, but uh, to try to change all of that. And then I had to think about the color of my tie uh, that I've always worn at purple on Easter. And then you think, well, they're trying to co-opt it. I'll tell you what, they've tried to co-opt the rainbow. That was the Lord's. Uh, they tried to co-opt now Easter uh, and all these things. The Lord is the one uh, who has the control over all those things. Uh, and one day he's coming back and he'll set it all straight. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'm glad that we can make this day all about Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is a wonderful day and uh, it's been great. I asked the orchestra if they would play again tonight. Some were out in some other ministries. Uh, and some of you are singing. I could tell some were just trying to listen to the orchestra uh, and hear them. But we're going to have them play during the offering here in a little bit. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that again uh, as the Lord has uh, given us the ability to do. So we want to use our talents uh, for him. And others are using their talents at mopping up water in the back because I overflowed the baptistry. I don't know how I did it a second time in two days. But uh, they're back there working. And thank you for all who have 
pitched in on that. Uh, one day we're going to have a new body, amen? And not long from now we hope to have a new baptistry, <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a similar thought there. And uh, so anyways, you pray, pray over all of that. Looking forward to uh, a great spring, just thinking about things coming up like uh, Oconee Baptist Junior Camp coming up at the beginning of June. Our juniors love that. We're actually going to be doing teen camp the same week, different camp. Uh, so we'll be going a couple different directions. And so start thinking about your juniors and teens uh, going to camp early in June. Then late in June, we have Vacation Bible School. Uh, and we've got some pastoral uh, church interns coming over the summer uh, and the missions trip to uh, South Utah, and just some great things coming up. I hope that you'll be all in for the Lord Jesus Christ this year. It doesn't mean you have to do everything we've got on the calendar. Obviously, it applies differently for different ones, uh, but I hope that you'll be a part of it. And the next Sunday, we have the Faith and Freedom One Day uh, conference with Dr. Chuck Harding, and it'll uh, be a great day. Looking forward uh, to him speaking four different times throughout the day and uh, about our uh, Christian liberties and American heritage. And I don't think we worship our country, okay? But I've got, I'm glad we've got a country where we can worship our God freely, uh, and having that is a tremendous uh, privilege and a blessing. Uh, and so we want to thank God for those things. Let's begin with a word of prayer, uh, and then we're going to sing another song here. Lord, we thank you uh, for the freedoms that we have. Lord, we're saddened uh, to see the highest authority in our land uh, to sign an action uh, saying that this day is a day devoted to transgenderism. Uh, Lord, we know that you made male and female. Uh, Lord, that you uh, are the one who uh, instituted it, the one who uh, gives that gender assignment. And Lord, although this world is trying to uh, ignore, even change all of that, uh, Lord, we know you still have a plan for every person that you create. Uh, and Lord, when we follow your plan, uh, then that's the best plan for our lives. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, help as we get in this society that seems to be getting darker uh, and darker. Uh, Lord, that we would continue to desire uh, to shine your light, uh, to be the light that you want us to be. Uh, Lord, I pray your blessings upon the service tonight. Lord, uh, encourage us. Uh, Lord, this is a sweet time to be together. And Lord, I pray that we would take away from it uh, the encouragement that we need. Uh, because you live, we can face tomorrow. And we're so grateful for that. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to sing a couple of verses of Psalm 19. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. We'll sing a couple of verses, then we're going to greet one another, and the orchestra is going to assemble up here during the greeting, and we'll come back and sing a couple more. <laughs> Greet one another, if you would, please.
Go back to page 19, please. We'll start with verse 4. Verse 4. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wound supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And shall be till. orchestra is going to play a couple of uh, verses of that song they played this morning, uh, Christ Arose. I hope that you'll be uh, blessed in hearing that. And uh, you might notice there's an empty chair down here. We also have uh, Brother Anthony Campbell plays the trombone, so he's also playing. Uh, but let me say, if you play an instrument or you used to play an instrument or willing to pick it up again, uh, let us know. Uh, I can't wait to get a set of timpani so Brother uh, Robert can play those for us. They're going to take up some room. I don't know where we'll get it, but uh, looking forward as we uh, see people use their talents for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. And uh, as the only person that messed up during the choir presentation this morning, uh, I can tell you, you can't keep from messing up. Uh, you, you're just going to make a mistake. It keeps you humble. Uh, but it's not a performance per se. Uh, it's really a ministry, first to the Lord. I love what it says in Acts chapter 13, they ministered unto the Lord. Uh, that's our primary ministry. And then uh, to edify the saints and uh, how encouraging it is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking his blessing on this offering. Lord, we thank you for uh, all the good things that we have had the opportunity to experience, Lord, because of you. Uh, Lord, if it weren't for our salvation, if it weren't for your local church, uh, all the things we would have missed uh, in this life. And, Lord, we're thankful for that. But most importantly, we would have missed heaven. And, Lord, we're thankful that uh, you gave your life so that we might have eternal life. And, Lord, I pray your blessings on the orchestra now as they played. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
blessing. Uh, thank you for that, and we'll let them find their seats. Why don't we sing one more song? I just want to sing Amazing Grace. Can we sing that one there? Uh, Amazing Grace. I'm going to guess it's page 244, 246, right in there in your songbook. So we'll find that one and uh, sing that together. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Let's sing it together. Here's page 244. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through really sing out on this one, okay? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the chapter we might entitle the resurrection chapter in the Bible, uh, not because it records uh, the events of the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, but because it records the impact of uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so uh, find your place there in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's my message tonight, the impact of the resurrection. Uh, we know that he was raised again uh, from the dead, but what does that mean? Uh, what changed because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead? Uh, did he come, uh, live a sinless life, die a cruel death, uh, then be raised from the dead and ascend back into heaven almost like a blip on uh, the, the history and timeline of mankind and that's it. We know about it or did it actually change uh, something drastically when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and this passage purports that yes it does and not only tells us how it impacted, but what it impacts. And I want to talk about that uh, tonight. And I'm going to work mathematics into this because I love math. And so uh, if you're a math geek, you'll like it too. And if you don't like math, you're not going to like it either. So uh, pick your poison there tonight. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read uh, several verses. I hope that you will uh, follow along. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to start in verse 12. 12, uh, not disregarding the first part of the uh, book, but we'd be there all night long if we were uh, start in 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Uh, so we're going to start in 12 tonight. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? By the way, that was a leftover uh, teaching from the Sadducees who did not believe there was a resurrection. And if somebody was saved uh, out of that Jewish, Jewish sect 
called the Sadducees, they would have trouble uh, believing in the resurrection of the dead. And maybe we might say it, uh, you just die a dog's death. When you die, they put you in the grave and that's the end of things. Uh, But the Pharisees did believe uh, in the resurrection from the dead. Uh, So this was something that they were dealing with and apparently uh, some were doubting this resurrection from the dead. And he was basically saying this, you don't know all of what you're saying because if there is no resurrection, that has a major impact and he begins to explain. Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. Yea, and if we are found, uh, yea, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He ha- He raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins, and they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you uh, for the clarity of your word, how that you give us exactly what we need to know. And Lord, I pray tonight when we walk out of these doors, we'll uh, recognize uh, the great importance of the resurrection uh, to our faith. And Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. When I was in school, I got to the point in mathematics called geometry. How many of you have taken geometry uh, as a subject? My mother, when she was in school, it was an optional course. She did not take geometry. Uh, But by the time I came along, it was a a mandatory course. And they began to open up the subject matter, and they had uh, uh, axioms and uh, theorems and all of this stuff. And uh, boy, I tell you what, I, it was just kind of overload at first. I didn't think I was going to do very well uh, in it because when they broke the subject, it's like they dropped the bomb on you. And it wasn't like algebra. I was pretty good at algebra. And it was a left turn into the field uh, when you start going into geometry. And so I was trying to uh, catch up with it. But I finally got my feet on the ground when they started to talk about logic and how that one thing leads to another logically, and they began to lay it out in what they called proofs. How many remember doing a proof uh, in geometry? How many of you still don't know the right answer to those proofs uh, in geometry? Uh, And it'll say, well, if this is true, then you can make the next statement. That statement will be true, and here's the reason. And then it says, but if that's true then this is also true, and here's the reason. Well, wait a second. If that's true, then this is true, and this is where a ga- math geek like me just gets excited. I'm like, well, wait a second. Something else is true, too. I have trouble when I help young people with geometry because I see all kinds of possibilities when I get in the middle of a proof. I'm like, well, you've got uh, CPCTC right there. How do you remember that little uh, across golf kids like throwing their hands up? Uh, don't ask me quote that is, what that is. Uh, you know, and you have all these tools, and you're just like, wow, there's this, and there's that, and if, it, if it's that, then there, you could do this also, and you get all excited. Okay, I get all excited. (laughs) That type of logical thinking is what the Apostle Paul appealed to when he began to deconstruct their argument about there being no resurrection. He said, well, you're saying there's no resurrection, but I've, I've got to tell you, if that's not true, then this is not true. And if this is not true, guess what? That's not true. 
Oh, man. And if that is not true, this other thing is definitely not true. And that leads to this last thing that's not true also. <laughs> he said, you've made a mess by just taking one, I say a little brick, it's a big brick, uh, out of the bottom, he said the Christian faith would begin to crumble. Do you realize that if you remove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is a foundational principle upon which the Christian faith would then crumble? And he talks about the implications of doing uh, such a thing. Now, you say, are we allowed to use logic? I thought we lived by faith, okay? I will tell you this. The Bible tells us to love our Lord with all of our soul, uh, with all of our heart. But he also says to love him with all of our mind. Let me tell you, if we dedicate our mind and surrender it to the Lord, a sanctified mind under the guidance of the Holy Spirit can be used as a great tool. I believe Peter was not somebody highly educated, but the Apostle Paul was highly educated, but he didn't allow it to cause him to be aloof, uh, to be proud, to look down on others, but he used the mind that he had uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, some of you in here, you got real geeked out about that mass stuff. Let me uh, encourage you to uh, dedicate your mind to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you don't have to shut your mind off to believe in the Lord. Uh, you can be fully engaged and still uh, have complete faith uh, in what God has said. And we need brilliant minds uh, to be given to the Lord's work. It seems like when somebody knows something or has a, uh, a talent of some type, especially intellectually, the world says, we'll take you right over here and you'll make big bucks because you're smart. But can I tell you, the Lord's servants need to be smart too. Uh, and we ought to dedicate ourselves to using our mind uh, for Christ. That's my little plug uh, for all those geeks out there uh, to use your talents for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's what he says uh, as he begins to uh, point out those implications. He says, first of all, if there's no resurrection, if resurrection isn't possible, then you would have to conclude that Christ did not ri rise again from the dead. Uh, I don't know if they were offering Jesus a special exception that he raised, but nobody else does. But Paul says you would have to sweep him uh, into this broad generalization about no resurrection, uh, that Christ was not raised. Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, uh, then is Christ not risen. There are plenty of people that would tell you that he did not rise again. Uh, matter of fact, there's been some discoveries that where they supposed uh, that Jesus and his family were found in ossuaries, which are bone boxes, if you will, uh, limestone boxes where they would keep uh, the bones of the family. If they needed to move somewhere, they would take the box with them. Uh, and so James Cameron and his crew in a documentary decided to, that they found the lost tomb of Jesus uh, and he was there. Uh, Jesus' name was on one, and then they knew it was him because the one next to him was Mary, and everybody knew that Mary Magdalene was his girlfriend. That's what they say out there. Hey, by the way, be careful of taking your doctrine from television shows. A lot of people got on the chosen bandwagon, but I'll tell you what, uh, although the chosen may be a, a, a neat portrayal, uh, we don't get our doctrine from television shows, we get it from here. And sometimes because we want to be entertained, we'll even watch a show, and I know it's not right, you know, I'm not getting this from my Bible, I get that on Sunday, but before long, you can begin recording things in your mind the wrong way. I even spoke to a pastor here recently. He said, I've given up watching The Chosen because I started reading my Bible, and every time I saw the Lord speak, I thought of the picture of the guy uh, on the thing. He said, all of a sudden, he became Jesus in my mind, and he said, I shut it off and ran away from it after that point. Uh, how careful we must be. And, and so there are those who make these documentaries and they sound real smart and, and uh, they had Jesus and Mary Magdalene and then their son Joshua all in this ossuary. And as soon as they begin to investigate it, 
they found it was entirely false. I mean, it was from the wrong century. Uh, there was nothing to do with it. Did that get them to post a retraction about the movie, The Lost Tomb of Jesus? No, absolutely not. Matter of fact, they said, well, we weren't trying to say anything about the Bible. We were just making an interesting uh, documentary. Uh, you know, sometimes we can follow down those paths of those who would say, well, Christ is not raised from the dead. Uh, his body was moved, or uh, as Islam says, Judas Iscariot was crucified in his place. Jesus moved to India and lived out his days. I'm here to tell you Jesus Christ died, was placed in that tomb, and rose again from the dead. But he says, hey, listen, if there's no resurrection and Christ is not raised, then he says this, if Christ is not raised, our preaching is vain. Our preaching is vain. In other words, we're sharing a message that isn't real. Now, I, I love to see Christians mature. Maybe they get saved as a young person or as a young adult. But as time goes by, their relationship with Christ means more and more to them. Uh, I know that because I preach to people of all ages, uh, and I can see some people that, uh, you know, they're just still young, and Christ being resurrected is not a big deal to their life. But I see some, some adults that just can't hardly keep their seat uh, when you start preaching about the resurrection of Christ. Why? It's become meaningful to them. Now, let me tell you this here. Uh, if someone says, hey, all this preaching we've been doing, it's all a hoax, I'd say it's not. Uh, don't tell me it's a hoax. <laughs> you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. You can never take that away. Uh, now, this matter here, he says, uh, really our preaching, I mean, if there's no resurrection, Christ isn't resurrected, and if Christ res isn't resurrected, then our preaching is vain. If our preaching is vain, then verse 15 says, we're false witnesses of God. Paul said, we've gone everywhere telling everybody that Jesus Christ uh, was raised from the dead. I, I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, about that second verse where he says, well, I delivered unto you that which was also delivered unto me. <laughs> uh, in other words, he says, I got it and I just passed it on to you. I didn't make it up. I didn't write it. Uh, I'm the delivery boy. Uh, matter of fact, pray for me on Tuesday. I'll be preaching a message uh, in which I'm going to tell all the pastors in our statewide fellowship, we got to deliver the message. I'm going to throw a newspaper across the auditorium. Uh, so you pray for me. I don't hit anybody, all right? Uh, but it's just a, a delivery of a message. We're just delivering a message. Paul said, I didn't make this up. He said, but if it's wrong, I've delivered a message that's not true. Uh, I've delivered a message that's been false. I've been telling everybody, and people have been believing he said, all of that's, all of this is, is, is nothing. Go home. Uh, none of this counts for anything. Can you imagine years and years of sitting and listening, and someone says, well, the resurrection of Christ isn't really true. And you're like, well, what are the implications of that? And you start to realize that none of this has any validity. He goes one step further and says, if Christ is not raised, then our faith is vain, and we are still in our sins. We got an insurance policy that we don't know has never been activated. We are depending on it. Uh, we had a lady in our church in California. Everybody called her Miss Linda B. Yeah, now, Miss Linda B was just fun to be around. She may say some unsanctioned things uh, here and there. I always tried to get to the visitors before she did because she would say, why are you coming to this church? You running from something? I mean, just out of the blue. Now, to her credit, they all thought it was funny, and it endeared them to our church, and so God blinded their eyes, and they came anyways. <laughs> but Miss Linda B. was a widow because uh, her husband had passed away. Uh, he was a delivery man. He was on the back of the truck, uh, and when he went to step off the truck, his leg broke. He went into the hospital. He got an infection. He stayed there about 63 days and then passed away. She was supposed to be taken care of. He had a life insurance uh, policy that would pay off the house, that would take care of all of her needs. When she went to cash in on that policy, they said, there is a clause in there that if you linger in the hospital more than 60 days, then there is no payout 
He literally lingered just a couple of days too long, and she was left destitute. By God's grace, she made it through, and she never lost her joy. Uh, She was just happy as a clam all the time. Now, the truth is, that type of policy he's saying is what you have. You expect that life, when it's over with, well, you'll spend it forever with Christ, and yet none of that is coming to fruition if there is no resurrection. And if Christ is not raised, he goes to tell us that our loved ones who trusted in Christ, they're not in heaven, that they have perished. So he said, when you start pulling... At that block, how many of you have ever played that game of Jenga? Uh, the Jenga tower, you start pulling the blocks out, and you're like, wow, I thought it needed all these blocks, right? Uh, and, it, and you get down, and finally you get down to one, and it is needed, because when you start pulling, everything is founded on that. <laughs> and you pull, and you pull, and finally when you decide to snatch that thing out of there, the whole thing crumbles, He's saying that is the resurrection of Christ. When we snatch it out of there, our faith has no foundation. But, I love a timely but in the Bible. Verse 20 says, but Christ is risen. Uh, But now is Christ risen? He says he is risen. Oh, then we need to go back and fix that proof, don't we? Because we got all these things that are not happening because Uh, there is no resurrection. He says, but there's a problem with all that. He actually is risen. Uh, If you go back before this, he tells of all the people that saw him. uh, And he said, many of them are alive to this day. In other words, if he wanted to call some witnesses to the stand, or if he said, hey, if you want to deny that Jesus rose again from the dead, try it with these people. I mean, go ahead. It's interesting that it took 150 years before they could get a solid heretical teaching that Jesus never rose again because every time it came up, somebody who had actually seen Jesus rise again from the dead or their daddy or granddaddy had said, don't even start that. We saw him alive and they testified of it. Interestingly, of miraculous events it far outweighs any other historical record of multiple attestation. In other words, hundreds of people attesting to the very same thing. In a historical record, that is monumental. Uh, That many people all testifying. What did they testify to? That Christ is raised from the dead. Well, then let's go back and make some corrections and we'll erase that proof and put the right information in because if Christ is raised, then there is resurrection. Kind of with that, put that one in there. Wait, 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 wait. That's not all. Our preaching and our faith are not in vain. Uh, Because Christ is raised from the dead. And all those people that we told that he is raised again uh, believed in something that is absolutely true. And so it's not in vain. Our witness is true. We're not false witnesses. Uh, We are true witnesses. And those that have died are asleep in Christ, and we will see them again. Uh, By the way, if you ever get into the rest of this passage, uh, you'll find that he talks about baptism for the dead. It's a hypothetical. It doesn't mean that we should be baptizing ourselves for some dead person to try to get them uh, into uh, heaven. He uses this as a hypothetical. Uh, What he is saying, though, is that those that are asleep in Christ will be raised again. And guess what? We're not still in our sins. That if Christ is raised from the dead, the Bible says that he was raised again for our justification. Uh, He is alive. If he stayed in the grave, then there's nobody at the right hand of the throne of God as our advocate securing our salvation. He wouldn't be there. Therefore, there's no one able uh, then to be that mediator between God and man, if Jesus is still in the grave. But if he is alive, guess what? Our sins are covered. What a wonderful truth. That means all of this hinges on this truth. What an amazing impact. I don't know if you've ever done much work with doors, 
There for a while, doors were my thing. Uh, I installed front entry doors. I installed pocket doors, and I hate them. Uh, I installed French doors. Uh, I got so good at French doors, I would be installing a French door, and a guy that was in our company also installing one, I'd be walking him through it. I'd be like, in that, yes, the upper screw, uh, middle screw, top hinge, suck that in about, no, just a quarter of an inch. Hey, it works great now. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, call me back if you need anything. I mean, uh, I was just doing doors. I did cabinet doors. I mean, uh, I just did doors upon doors. I realized something really important, how much a hinge plays. Uh, and I would take all the screws out of this hinge, and I'd take all the screws out of that hinge, but that final hinge, if you didn't do something and prop that door up, you start to take that hinge off and everything bearing on that hinge, it's amazing uh, what damage could be done when you removed it. Now he was saying it all hinges on this thing of resurrection. Now he goes further, and this is where the meat of the message is this evening, and that is what hinges on this one thing? Or in other words, how did the resurrection impact us particularly? So now we go down even further, and we see in verse 21, we're going to see the comparison of Adam and Christ, or maybe I should say this, the contrasting typology the contrasting. It's like there's a comparison in a way, but that comparison is to say they're different. Uh, they're the same, but they're different. And the difference is very important. First of all, look if you would there in verse 21. He says, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So we see by man came death, that's Adam, uh, by man uh, came that resurrection uh, from, the de from death, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't know if you know, but our nation uh, at its founding was using the New England primer uh, as the guide for which young people would learn to read. Each letter had a little poem. How many of you have ever seen the New England primer? Uh, it had a little poem that they would learn the letter. The first letter, A, was Adam. That was the first letter. And the statement made in the New England primer was, in Adam's fall, we died all. Uh, in Adam's fall, we died all. That was, that's what they learned in kindergarten. Okay, they didn't have people in drag trying to read books to children. Uh, they actually taught them to read using theological foundational principles right there in uh, their primer. What does it mean in Adam's fall, we died all? Take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 5. We're going to kind of go back and forth between the two, so I encourage you to keep your place there. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. How many of you have memorized this verse before? Romans 5, verse 12. Great part uh, of sharing the gospel using this verse. Uh, in verse 12, it says this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that, how many have sinned? All have sinned. Does it surprise you this evening that everybody sitting in here is a sinner? Isn't that shocking? I just said you're a sinner. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we don't have to look at our record very far to recognize I am uh, a sinner. Now, we may not recognize what that means, but I think all of us, if we said, uh, hey, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we say, I have no problem with that verse. It's evident that as a human, I have sinned. Adam sinned, and that sin came with a price tag called death. You say, well, physical death, everybody dies, so it's not a big deal. But the Bible is clear. There's two deaths. There's a physical death, and then there is an eternal spiritual death separated from God. And the place that that is uh, taken is in a place called the lake of fire. 
And all people will stand before God in that final day. And when they stand before God, the Bible says this, uh, that those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, do you know who the Lamb is? That's Jesus Christ. Who are not written in there will be cast into the lake of fire. So God says, hey, uh, this matter of death is not just physical death, but it is eternal spiritual death uh, in a lake of fire. Now, Matthew chapter 25 lets us know it was not created for us. It was created for the devil and his angels. But when we participate in the rebellion against God that his, the devil and his angels have, we also have an eternal destiny in the lake of fire. So he says, in Adam, we all died. In Adam, everyone became a sinner, and that penalty then falls onto us as well. In other words, what Adam did got us all in trouble. That Adam, if I'd have been there, I'd have wrecked it a whole lot sooner, I'm sure. We all think, well, if Adam hadn't done that, he'd have done it eventually. Because a time comes that once we sin, uh, that sin would be passed. And so Adam is one uh, who sinned. And in Adam, we could say this, we died. In Adam, we died. But then there's the contrast. Look again in Romans chapter 5. In verse 15, he says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. That's a funny phrase. It's a contrast and comparison. Uh, There is a comparison in that in Adam, we all died, and in Christ, we all receive something. But what we get from Adam is the product of a corrupted fruit. But what we would get in Christ is the sweetness uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the righteousness of God. So although there is a comparison, yes, there is one who then sheds that upon many. The difference is that what we get from Christ is not death and hell, but we get life and eternity. Now, now this is the difference. In Adam's fall, we died all, but in Christ, we are all made alive. So zip back over uh, to 1 Corinthians 15. He says in verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Uh, So we're made alive in Christ. Now it's interesting that he says all are made alive. Let's reference again to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 15. Let's hear him out on the rest of this verse. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. He says, so here it is, Adam and his wife, and then they have some children. You know what? Those children were sinners. I mean, it didn't take them long before they had committed some of the most egregious sin, including murder. That first generation, there was already murder in their heart. So we see that becoming, and that sinfulness expands to the point in which we see in the generations of Noah it was almost a complete wickedness. If it weren't for the testimony of the remnant of Noah's family, that seems there'd be nobody that had any righteous intention in their heart. And God said, we're gonna start over. Or we're gonna start over again. Now we see that beautiful picture of uh, salvation, but we also see Noah stepping off the ark. Uh, and you say, we got a fresh start in Noah. He's the second Adam. Right? He is then the founder of all generations. Everybody comes through Noah. I'm sure he's better than the first Adam. Matter of fact, he gets no mention at all in the process because he steps off the ark. He gets drunk. His son comes into him. He dishonors God. And so the sinfulness continues. But there is coming a second Adam. 
that one who would come and uh, he would change all of that, that nature uh, of sin, that uh, prognosis of death could happen in Christ. Now, I do want to note at the end of verse 15 in Romans chapter 5, it says it has abounded to many. But 1 Corinthians 15 says that all are made alive in Christ. Why many and not all? Well, I've got an answer for that. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For therefore we both labor and suffer approach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. He's the Savior of all men. How many people did Jesus Christ die for? Now, you know, many people answer that question, as many as will be saved, those are the ones that he died for. Now, I would understand intellectually there is some validity to that because he does know everybody that would be saved. And therefore, he does die for all that would be saved. It would be applied to them. But theologically, the Bible says this, he is the propitiation for our sins, but not our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. Uh, in other words, the atonement of Jesus Christ was offered freely to all. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he made this statement. He said, Father, forgive them. Why? For they know not what they do. He was offering forgiveness to those who did not even recognize their need of salvation. Amen. Therefore, the atonement that he had, it was for all who are in Christ. Now, how many accepted? Well, it abounds to many. Uh, many have trusted Christ. Many have put their faith. And especially those that believe have found salvation. Now, think of this. Everyone that comes in Christ is made alive. And therefore, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, all are made alive. All in Adam, they died in sin. But all in Christ are made alive. That means that Adam is the federal head. How many of you have heard that theological term, the federal head? You're like, I'm about to pay a bunch of money to federal government. Does that have uh, anything to do with it? Uh, I hope you get a tax return. I just want you to say, if you do, don't tell me about it, because you're not supposed to discourage a brother, all right? Uh, you're supposed to be edifying. I mean, just act as sorrowful. Act like you paid a bunch of taxes, even if, if you didn't. You know, they say misery loves company. Uh, I don't think so, all right? No, we don't want to hear about it. Now, when it comes to this federal, it means that which covers all, and Adam being the single source uh, of humanity. You say, well, science says, I'll tell you what science says. They tra tracked chromosomes back, chromosome pairs, and they said, it's not possible that man could have come from multiple sources because the way of chromosome pairs are, they traced them back, and they said, there has to be a single guy back there from which all those chromosomes started, a single male that they came from. You know what science nicknamed that male? Adam. I find that ironic. <laughs> that while denying <laughs> the creation of God, they nicknamed him uh, Adam. Truly, we are found with a common father in Adam. Genesis chapter 5, if you would. Let's turn there. Genesis chapter 5. I've only got about three more hours in this sermon, so I hope my voice holds out. <laughs> Paul preached till midnight. It only cost him the life of one guy, only one. <laughs> he fell out. That's what they say down south. He fell out. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son. What's the next one say? In his own likeness. And after his image, and we know this applies to Cain and Abel as well, uh, and called his name Seth. So we see that that fallen image of Adam, now I, I agree with you that we're image bearers of God, but we also have to know that that bearing of the image, it was marred in Adam. It was marred in Adam. 
Now, I believe us bearing the image of God gives us inestimable value in the eyes of God. I believe that applies to children that are unborn. They already bear the image of God, and to take their life uh, is murder. I think to judge somebody uh, as being less valuable to society because they have some sort of uh, uh, De deficit or deficiency, so to speak, and, and uh, sometimes people have been judged that way. I know the Nazis tried to eliminate those with Down syndrome uh, because they believe them to be deficient uh, and need to be removed from the gene pool. Can I tell you, those that truly believe in, in Christian values and biblical values know that anybody that bears the image of God has value and, can, and should not be violated. Okay, so that remains true. But let me say this, that image of God in Adam was marred. Just as if you stuck your hand in a wet painting and turned it, so we no longer have a clear image of God and so there had to be an Adam that came. I don't know, is there one that came who was the express image of God? Who said that if you see me, you see God? Uh, uh, oh yeah, his name is Jesus, and he was the Adam that would erase the error of the first Adam. He would restore as John Milton wrote, paradise regained, uh, that that which was lost uh, would be uh, regained. Jesus would be the first fruits. Verse 20 again in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. First fruits, an agricultural term, that they would yield... Uh, a first harvest. Now, there's another interesting one I mentioned this morning about a study, but I would encourage you to look up first fruits in the Bible uh, and search out uh, first fruits and how that God says we should give to Him uh, our first fruits. That first fruit term, uh, it not only means uh, the primary, it means the best. Uh, they'll never be as good as that. Uh, the Bible Museum over there uh, in LaGrange, I'd encourage you to visit it. They've got a lot of really neat things, but they talk about the first fruits of the uh, olive harvest, and that would be the one that they would want to make into things that they would eat because it would be the best. And then after that, it would uh, not be as good, and finally they would have uh, kind of the worst harvest. They made it into lamp oil and things of that nature. Uh, Jesus is the first fruits. Uh, he is the best but he is also the one that came first. Let me just simplify it this way. He was the first one to walk out of that grave, but he won't be the last one. Uh, he, he's the first one uh, to come up out of the grave uh, and remain alive forevermore. He's not the last one, verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. Uh, afterwards, they that are Christ. Now, who will be changed? Who will be changed? Well, we will all who sleep in Christ uh, be changed, or if we alive and remain, the Bible says, will not prevent them which sleep, uh, but we will be gathered together with him to meet the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, some of you uh, are new here, but we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, okay? I believe in a seven-year uh, tribulation, okay? Some people are different uh, on that. I believe I can give you clear Bible reasons, and then I believe in a literal thousand-year millennial reign of Christ uh, on this earth, not amillennial, uh, not a, just an analogy, uh, but that truly Christ will rule uh, and reign as he said uh, on this earth. Now, in this matter of him bringing us up, if we look in Revelation, we see that he brings us up for a marriage supper of the Lamb, and then he returns with 10,000s of his saints. So we've got to go if we're going to come back, all right? Uh, so just some theological things here. But also, he says in that moment which we're taken from this earth, whether we're taken out of the grave or if we're meeting the Lord in the air, he says this, we shall all be changed. Amen. I'm going to give you a rundown, then I'm done. How are we going to be changed? Verse 35, 
And some man will say, I love that, and some man will say, some doofus <laughs> will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Right? Ever thought about that? Well, I mean, you stick somebody in the ground, they don't stay good very long. Martha said, by now he stinketh. <laughs> Four days in the grave, and he's a mess. You don't go digging him up. And so somebody says, well, if you believe in resurrection, well, no, why, what's he going to come up with? How is that going to be? And Paul almost laughs in their face. Okay, he says this. Verse 36, thou fool. We would say, you idiot. What's wrong with you? He didn't say, I'll give you back the old body. How many of you say, I don't want it back. <laughs> I want a new one. Uh, I don't want this old one, this one that's just going downhill and downhill. They would raise me again for a hundred more doctor's appointments. Who wants that? Give me LASIK surgery for the 15th time. No, the truth is that he's almost scoffing at it because they never presented resurrection as if they brought that same old body back up again. He says, we're going to receive a new body, uh, that this body is going to be one uh, that is incorruptible. Uh, in verses 36 and 37, he uses the picture of grain. Uh, now, how many have ever planted something and then had it grow? Okay, uh, so if you plant a corn grain, okay, I know this may be shocking, but you get a corn stalk, okay? <laughs> Probably on the veggie tails, you just get corn just popping out of the ground, okay? But, but in real life, a stalk grows up. In other words, the form of is entirely different. You throw the grain in the ground and accept the grain die and germinate in the ground, then it doesn't grow. He says, so you got to die, and then you'll be raised. He said, but the form is different. Uh, the form has changed. He expounds on that in verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural, and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Amen. Quickening means livening, giving life. Okay, so Adam, life was given to him, but Christ gives life to others. Amen. So he says this is, this is the fundamental difference. There is a change, a, a form change. But secondly, there's a fundamental change. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthy. I'm sorry, as is earthy, I like that. Uh, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also uh, that are heavenly. You can't drag this corpse into heaven. Doesn't fit there. It doesn't belong in heaven. Matter of fact, it belongs down here. I don't know if you've ever eaten potato chips or something and you feel like you're tasting the ground. Ever feel like that? You're like, that's pretty earthy right here. Yeah, that's what this body is. It's made of the ground. It's going back to the ground. He says, we have to be fitted with a new body so that we can enter into the heavenly. Verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the earthly, so we... So, I'm sorry, we, also, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. There is a fundamental change. A form change, a fundamental change. Thirdly, a fast change. A fast change. Did you notice this next part? Verse 51, this is posted in uh, nurseries all over the land. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How fast? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. 
For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. He said it's just going to be like that. It doesn't take any time. Uh, in the moment that Christ comes, that change will be made. By the way, if he can create all the galaxies with the word of his mouth, uh, in a moment he speaks and it stands firm so he can change our body in the moment and the twinkling of an eye, it can happen. One person said, how fast is the twinkling of an eye? It's defined as the span of time between when the light turns green and the person behind you honks their horn. <laughs> that, that's the span of time. Now, how many of you these days with people and their cell phones at lights, you're the horn honker? I know I am. And being honked at a few times. All right. It is a fast change. Why? Because this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on uh, immortality. It's a form change, a fundamental change, a fast change, and it is a final change. Amen. It is a final change. Verse 54, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to the pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting now? I added the word now. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? When Jesus walked out of that grave, I want you to know, I'm not being unbiblical. The Bible says he made an open showing of conquering death, sin, and the grave. But when he walked out of that grave, I think he said something along the lines of, what now? What now? Death has no grasp for every believer that's laid to rest and your loved ones and my loved ones that sleep in Christ and where death thinks it has a grasp on it, its grip has lost its power because Christ walked up out of that grave. So the impact is not just uh, the theological concern about our faith, but the impact is this, that you and I, as Christ is our first fruits, when the time comes that we're laid to rest or the Lord returns, death will lose its grip on us. And death has no sting. The grave has uh, no victory, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And no take backs. No take backs. I'm thankful that when we get saved, the Bible says we're sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. He doesn't take back our salvation. And I'm thankful he doesn't take back his promise when he says that those that lay in the grave will rise again. We know for sure that is true. He'll never take it back. And I'm thankful that he, we will be changed. So here's my final word. Hang in there. You say, why do you conclude that way? Because Paul did. After this passage on resurrection, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. Now listen to this. This is the rundown. Our faith is not in vain. Our preaching is not in vain. Our labor is not in vain. Because he lives, guess what? I can face tomorrow. Uh, I, I love that little phrase, this child can face uncertain days. Now, I misread that the first time I read it. I thought it meant that the, there was an uncertain amount of days that he would. So I changed it to unending days. Now, I, I have trouble because I just sing it that way. This child can face unending days. Now, I'm glad for eternal life. I'm also thankful that you and I can face uncertain days because we know one day this isn't the end. We're going to be with the Lord. The impact of the resurrection on you and I, let it soak in. Let it make Easter Monday a good day because the Lord's truth of the resurrection and when this is all over with, and I can't make you any promises how this is going to go. Somebody this year is going to come to me and say, Pastor, I've got cancer. 
Uh, we've got one that's just been plugging away through treatment after treatment. Comes on Sunday morning, sits right down here, uh, going through treatment after treatment. I can't tell you if this is all going to go good or even go smooth, but I can tell you this, we will all be changed and God will give us the victory. Lord, we thank you for your truth. Lord, we're thankful that it's laid out so we can get a hold of it. Lord, I pray that we would. Forgive me when I live a life that's less than victorious, when you won our victory at the cross. Lord, I pray that you would help me to embrace and incorporate these truths into my daily living. I'd pray for us as a church that resurrection would not just be the topic of Easter Sunday, but it would be on our mind all the time that the lost will die and not face that resurrection to life, but they'll face resurrection to damnation. They need the gospel. But when our loved ones go and we know they're in Christ, that truth of resurrection means we'll see him again. And the truth of resurrection means this is not the end. This is only the beginning. Lord, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that Jesus Christ walked out of that grave unscathed by death. Lord, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. With heads bowed.